Gerald Croft is Priestley's tool to reveal the flaws of the upper classes. He represents the aristocracy who in 1912 exploited the working classes, especially working class women like Eva Smith. For a moment in the play, he appears to be sorry for his behaviour towards Eva, providing hope that the upper classes can change and embrace Priestley's message of social responsibility. At the end of the play, however, he once again aligns himself with Mr Burling's capitalist ideas, conveying Priestley's view that the upper classes will always be self-interested and will never change. When we first meet Gerald Croft, Priestley describes him in the introductory stage directions as an easy, well-bred young man about town. Priestley's use of the rule of three, with the adjectives easy, well-bred, young, establish him as a member of a privileged elite class, used to a life of leisure. It's surprising that the word young is used when he's been described as roughly 30 years old. Perhaps Priestley suggesting that his attitude towards life is immature and thoughtless, and this foreshadows what we later learn about his irresponsible behaviour towards Eva and Sheila. It also raises false hope that, like the younger Burlings, Gerald will learn from his mistakes. The phrase man about town shows that he is a fashionable socialite and implies experience in the ways of the world. It also implies vanity in that he prioritises himself, his appearance and his sexual needs over helping others. And this could foreshadow the later revelation that he used Eva Smith to satisfy his needs before discarding her when their relationship was no longer convenient. Bearing in mind that the play was first performed in Moscow in 1945, Gerald's privileged appearance and demeanour would have confirmed communist beliefs about the lazy, wealthy elite living a life of privilege at the expense of the poor. The 1946 London audience however, is likely to have contained men like Gerald. The stage direction therefore sets Gerald up as a character with whom some members of the audience will engage, sympathise with and finally condemn. Gerald is Priestley's tool to reveal the flaws of the upper classes. First of all, Priestley reveals that Gerald's parents, Lord and Lady Croft, are unable to attend his engagement party and this confirms Gerald's role as a member of the upper classes. The audience might initially assume that Gerald wants to marry Sheila because he's madly in love with her. However, there are references throughout the play to his absences during the summer, which makes the audience wonder about him. We discover that Sheila was right to be concerned when we learn about his affair with Eva Smith. So why is he marrying Sheila? We can only assume that as the son of a successful businessman and aristocrat, there are business opportunities for Crofts Limited and Burling and Co, which Mr Burling references in his engagement speech and with which Gerald agrees, saying, Hear, hear. We therefore suspect that Gerald has business-focused reasons for marriage, he's deceitful to Sheila and he prioritises business over love. Gerald very much allies himself with Mr Burling in business matters and like Mr Burling, he initially denies knowing Eva Smith. His attitude is dismissive when he says, I don't come into this suicide business. The phrase suicide business is cold-hearted and unexpected. Suicide is not a business in the sense that Crofts Limited is a business. However, business can also mean a difficult matter or a scandalous event. By using the phrase suicide business, Priestley positions Gerald as superior because he implies that others are responsible for Eva's death. His reaction soon changes when he hears Eva Smith referred to as Daisy Renton, however, so Priestley positions the audience, which has seen Gerald's smug self-confidence, to enjoy his discomfort and his pending interrogation. Like Eric, Gerald considers the women who frequent the Palace Theatre bar only in terms of their appearance and criticises their doe faces and hard eyes. This reveals how the commodification of women is totally normal for him. His complimentary description of Eva Smith's big dark eyes reveals an attitude of objectification of her. He considers the women in the bar as if he's choosing an item in a shop. Rather than thinking of her as a person, he's thinking of Eva as something for him to enjoy. He describes himself as saving Eva Smith from Joe Megarty, but the truth is he was not much better himself. When the inspector uncovers Gerald's affair with Eva, Priestley shows that Gerald is upset by her death. He reports ending the affair, saying, She didn't blame me at all. I wish to God she had now. Priestley here focuses the attention of the audience on what appears to be genuine remorse and self-blame. This makes the audience feel some sympathy towards Gerald as a character, and for a while, the audience believes he will align himself with the inspector's views of social responsibility. This is particularly exciting, as he's a member of a class that holds power and has lots of social contacts in the higher echelons of society. However, the audience changes its 
its opinion of Gerald, when in Act 3, he does everything that he can to prove the inspector is a fake. Unlike Sheila and Eric, he's learnt nothing at all. Like Mr. and Mrs. Burling, he wants to avoid a public scandal and to protect himself and his wealth. At this point in the play, Priestley sets the audience up to condemn Gerald, particularly when he offers Sheila the engagement ring, saying, everything's all right now. The audience sees that he's learnt absolutely nothing. Even if Eva does not exist, he refuses to reflect upon his treatment of Daisy Renton and to become a better person. To conclude, for a moment Priestley encourages the audience to sympathise with Gerald in the hope that he and the aristocracy he represents will become a better person. When this fails to happen, the disappointed audience condemns him and his attitude towards Eva and, by default, towards vulnerable members of society. Through Gerald, Priestley presents the aristocracy as self-interested people who, instead of sharing their wealth, are more likely to follow family tradition of preserving it for the next generation. Everything I go through in this video series can be found in the second, updated edition of Mr. Bruff's Guide to an Inspector Calls, and you can pick up a copy through following the links in the description. If you found this video useful, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.